Okay, um, I like to start all my lectures with some announcements. Uh, the first set of announcements for today, there's a data science day on Friday, that's tomorrow. Um, it's happening right here on campus in the union building. Um, since you are in this class, you might find this event interesting. It's a whole day of uh, research talks. There's an industry panel, there's a career fair. Uh, Jeff Leak from the Fred Hutch Center for uh, Cancer is he is visiting to give a talk, and then there's a research expo that kind of gives you a highlight of various types of data science research that's happening around campus. Um, oh, and there's breakfast. Um, so if you're interested, please. Uh, I think that QR code takes you to the sign up page. If you don't feel like doing that, go to data science.utah.edu, which is now all the information um, check it out and uh, it could be fun uh, in the past we've had uh, interesting sort of research topics that come out of this event just because you know you put two people doing two different but related things in the same room and have them talking to each other and interesting things happen another announcement another set of announcements uh, there's homework zero on canvas some of you have already started doing it some of you have looked at it and postponed it for the weekend or whatever. Um, it, you have a week for it. It's supposed to be not terribly hard. Um, are there any questions about homework zero? After I say it's not supposed to be really hard, maybe you will feel shy about asking questions. So let me rephrase that. It's super hard. <laughs> are there any questions? Yes. Um, I yes, and I fixed it uh, this morning. Right. Yeah. Uh, I think I put in fall 2023 uh, instead of spring. Yeah. Um, and the other thing is there's also uh, an optional survey on Canvas. Some of you already responded. Uh, this is mostly for my benefit. I just want to know you all. Um, and this is my way of getting to know things that you do you know, for, you know, your education and otherwise. In the past, we've had someone who claims, I never had any way of verifying, that they had they spend their free time building a trebuchet. Um, <laughs> you know, get interesting people in class. Um, there is still a waiting list for the class. Some of you are um, in uh, the waiting list, I think about eight or 10 of you. Um, the class is still oversubscribed. I'm trying to negotiate more space, um, or at least uh, I'm trying to negotiate something. Um, I think one way or another, the issues will get resolved by next week. Uh, the two ways are either I just tell you that, oh, there's no space, or I give you a permission code. Uh, those of you who are on the wait list and you're unable to attend the class um, or unable to register, you know, see the homework on Canvas, um, what I would say is, uh, whenever you get your permission code, I will give you a week from then. So don't worry about uh, losing out time for the homework zero. Any questions about any of these things, homework, the survey, or the wait list? Yes. You can see not the wrong, uh, you can see the questions that you got wrong. Right, but if it is the so wrong. I can fix it. Can someone else tell me? Okay. Oh, okay. And did you check after last afternoon? No. Okay, okay. So if it still doesn't work, post a message on Canvas. Um, Canvas has all these little knobs, you know, that I check some of them, I don't check some of them, and things work sometimes. So it should work. If it does not post a message, send a message to uh, just the, that particular thread. And uh, one of us will get to it. Other questions, comments? Anything on? Ah, yes. So one, uh, there's a comment on uh, Zoom that I wanted to clarify. There's a question slash comment that says, is it possible to hold TARs on Monday over Zoom? Um, yeah, so uh, if you look at the way the TARs are set up, we have one or some sort of help hour. So we, there's uh, one office hours from a TA on Monday, Tuesday is me, Wednesday and Thursday back to the TA. So 
four days a week, we are available to help you. Um, I'm going to try to see if uh, we will do at least one a week occasionally on Zoom, uh, just so that people who can't make it in person can still come to the help us. And we'll let you know which ones, if any, are on Zoom a little ahead of time. Uh, we'll post a message on Canvas. It depends on things like who's available and where and when and such things. Um, there was a clarification. There's a clarification. Um, uh, oh, right. So the question on Zoom is not just about the uh, not about TA hours on Monday in on Zoom, but specifically this Monday, because I think Monday is a holiday. Um, I'll get back on that. I'm not particularly keen on uh, having my TAs work on a holiday. Um, it just sets a bad precedent. And you know, those of you who are grad students feel you might feel obliged to work on a Monday or a Sunday or like every day. And I'll get back to you on that. A um, couple of clarifications from the last lecture. Uh, I think I misspoke about the programming homeworks, or I did something of that sort. The rule for homeworks, for all programming homeworks, is that you should not use any machine learning libraries. This means PyTorch, TensorFlow, um, Scikit-Learn, Weka, LibLinear, Jax, Keras. There are so many of them now. Um, you're not allowed to use any machine learning library. But that does not mean you're not allowed to use libraries that uh, help you with uh, linear algebra. In particular, uh, people have told me that NumPy is extremely helpful. If you've never used NumPy before, um, feel free to completely ignore everything I said so far. You're not required to use it. NumPy is just helpful for um, doing linear algebra in Python. And the other clarification is what languages are uh, and uh, libraries are you allowed to use? You can only use programming languages that are already installed in the Cade machine. We will not install any new languages for you. You can, you can only use those libraries that are already installed. We will not install any libraries for you. Um, that said, there are many languages in the Cade machines and there are only four of us and we know only a handful of languages. So if you decide to work on some language that none of us are familiar with, then we can't help. You're on your own. Um, we should be able to run it and at least, if necessary, give you partial credit if things go wrong. So if you write your code in a language, if you decide that today is the day to use assembly for all your homework, <laughs> we are not going to help you. Okay. Um, uh, one of the reasons why I, I ask you to, I encourage you to um, fill out the survey is one of the questions there is what programming languages are you comfortable with? Typically, um, people are comfortable with Python. Um, so about 95% of students in the last maybe five or six years have responded saying, I, given a choice, I'll work with Python. Uh, but it's not always been the case. So before, like maybe that number has been increasing, but there's been a sizable population who uses Java or C sharp or something. So I would just like to know what languages uh, you're comfortable with, mostly because maybe at some point in the future, we will design a lecture around some machine learning library. And if none of you know Python, then we'll just skip that lecture. So please fill up that survey. Any questions, any logistical issues or concerns that uh, you want to get out of the way before we jump into our lecture for today? If none, then let's dive in. Um, I'm going to try something to see if the lights get better. Is the contrast any better? Nah, you sleep. Um, so uh, we're going to talk about uh, 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 this is the first sort of content lecture um, uh, of the semester, and I'm going to introduce notation for uh, that we'll be using for the rest of the semester, um, and this is about supervised learning. 
In the previous lecture, we just uh, looked at this question of what does it mean for a program to learn? And the main point from the last lecture was that the most important thing about, uh, the, the most important way to think about whether learning is successful or not, is to think about whether there's any generalization happening. Learning is generalization, or to learn is to generalize. We also looked at the badges game. Today, we're going to just briefly revisit the badges game, and then I'll spend a, the rest of the lecture formalizing supervised learning and talking about all these things. So I'm not going to list them out right now. So let's go back to the badges game. Um, just to remind you, uh, this was uh, uh, the setting where every name tag had a name and a plus or a minus. And uh, uh, I, I invited you to go to the class website and look at the badges data to see if you could uh, come up with uh, the rule that I used. Has uh, anyone taken me up on that? Yes. Uh, yeah. And so before we, what's the label for Indiana Jones? So you claim it's positive. Uh, does anyone else have any other uh, answer? There's only one more answer here. There's only one other answer. Um, all right. Uh, so the question is, what's the rule? Uh, the rule is if the second to last letter is a vowel. The rule is if the second to last letter of what? Of the last name. Of the last name. Um, I think you're right. Yeah. So th this is good. Uh, how did you do it? Uh, I kind of looked at patterns. So I looked to see if there were people with the same first name, they had the same uh, label, and then they did it. And then I looked at people, there were a few matching last names, uh, and they had the exact same all the way through. It was like fire success. So I knew I had to do something with the last name. And then you just thought hard about it. There's a story about something called uh, Richard Feynman's algorithm, where the way to solve a problem is you read the question, you think hard, and you write down the answer. Um, so that's what you did. Um, the question, about the, how do you know that you got the right, how did you know that you got the right answer? And what learning algorithm did you use? Or do you have a name for that algorithm that you ran? I mean, it worked on all the data points. So all yeah. the data points I was given were successful. At that point, I guess it seemed to be right for what I was doing. But you were able to do that even for these six data points, right? We, with these six data points, many of you came up with rules that are that work on all the data points. So, so I, guess I guess those are, those ideas are good until you feel something that breaks through. Okay, that's an interesting thought. Um, so what you are saying is that there were two ninety four names in that list. As long as everything works for those two ninety four, you count yourself as successful. If the 295th one breaks it, then you, you're going to revisit from scratch. That's an interesting thought. It's kind of, uh, uh, hold on to that because that's a good uh, way to think about it. Alternatively, let's say the 295th badge got a label by mistake. Are you going to throw away all the evidence that you got from 294 names just because of that one possible error? In the data, I don't want you to answer it. I just want you to think about it, right? Um, the other thing is, how do you know you should look at the letter? Maybe there are other things. Maybe the font that was used on your screen, or maybe the time of the day that I used, or the or the timestamp on the file, or something like that. How I, I'm looking at you because you answered, but uh, in general, how, how do people know that uh, you should look at the letters and not other things? Um, you use this concept called vowel, and you use this concept called second to last letter. These are things that, you know, background knowledge that you brought from home. Where did you learn that? I mean, I didn't teach you that, that this is not a class on vowels and second to last letter. So clearly, you brought in knowledge from home that you used to uh, kind of think about how to assign those labels. The question, again, to think about is, how do you know what's the relevant knowledge? And how do you know what kind of knowledge you can very quickly reject as being irrelevant and why? This is a question that we'll keep coming to again and again. Uh, the badges game is a silly example, but 
it applies to all sorts of stuff, all sorts of situations where learning uh, shows up. How do you know what knowledge to bring in? How do you know which parts of the inputs are relevant? Um, and uh, how do you know that you're right? Any questions about any of these points? I'm not giving you any answers yet because these are the kinds of questions that we will be talking about as we go along. So let's uh, let's kind of go into a little bit more little bit more detail. What is supervised learning? Um, the example that I'm going to use for the lecture today is a decidedly degenerate newspaper. In this newspaper, people write articles, and then the uh, editor decides which section of the newspaper goes into. So newspapers usually have sections, right? You have sports, you have current affairs, you have entertainment, I guess, and such things. And uh, people, every uh, desk has an editor and there are journalists and writers who write for each section. In this made up newspaper, it's kind of upside down. People write an article and then you the editor decides, oh, this looks like uh, current affairs. Let's put it on this in this section. Yeah. So you have, an instance of a news article that needs to be classified into which section of the newspaper it needs to get into. There is this newspaper news article labeling device, a box that takes in an article and decides, oh, this is an article about sports. So that's the label. We'll call these things that are getting classified instances. It's a generic name, and this uh, is going to, the other name, the other word that shows up here is. It's also called examples. And the, the output of this device is a label. The, there is a, you know, you can imagine every possible newspaper article ever written, every possible article that will be written. So just the collection of all possible words in the English language, every arrangement of every word. Together, all of these constitute something called the instant space. The instant space is just a set of all possible instances or all possible examples that that exist today and might exist in the future. In the badges game, the instance space consists of every possible pair of names, first name and last name, every possible set of names, including the ones that were in the data, but also you know, names of all of us who are not in the data and names of people who don't exist. There is a hidden function. There's some function that we are hoping to learn that maps these instances into one of these categories. In this case, it's a set of categories. In general, we'll call this the label space. The label space is the set of, of all possible labels. More generally, I'll use the letter X almost consistently uh, throughout the semester to denote instances or examples. These are the set of, uh, the instance space is the set of examples that are inputs to a learning program, uh, or sorry, inputs to a predicting program. Um, it could be in the badges game, all names. If you want to classify the article, news articles, it's a set of all documents. It could be sentences, it could be images, it could be emails. If you want to have an automatic email tagging service um, or spam detector, for example, and you can anything that goes into an in uh, that becomes the input of a predictor is called an instance or an example, and the set of all possible ones is called the instance space. The label space is a set of all possible labels, and I will consistently use the letter Y for that, uh, capital Y or script Y to denote the label space. This denotes all possible outcomes of the prediction task. So if you have a spam detector, the instance space is the set of all emails. And the label space is just one of two categories, spam or not spam, or more generally, true or plus or false or minus. This is a, something called a binary classifier. There are only two categories. Now, the interesting thing here is there is, we, we are going to pretend that there is a certain function. I'm going to use the letter F for that. There's a certain function F that takes an input instance 
and convert it into a label. This function is one that we do not know. We don't have access to that function. Sometimes I'll call this the target function. This is sometimes called the oracle. I'll just call it nature sometimes. This is a function that exists, that might exist, but we don't have access to. We are trying to discover this function. From this point of view, um, the goal of learning is to find this target function. So the goal of machine learning is essentially to search over the space of all functions, every mathematical function that can convert the instance into a label and try to find the one that is the target. It's like a huge needle in a haystack type problem. There's, imagine the set of every possible function, mathematical function that converts an email into spam or not spam. A simple function could be, if the length of the email is more than 5,000 characters, call it spam. Otherwise, call it not spam. Probably not a good function. It's a function, right? It's a candidate in our search tree. So every possible function that can convert an instance to a label is uh, the, is in the set that of set of interest. And the goal of learning is to find the one function that we don't have access to. This is the oracle. This is the mind of nature, if you will. So how do we go about this search? In order to help with this search problem, what we have is we don't have access to the function itself, but we have access to the function in action. We get to see what are called labeled examples. These labeled examples are pairs of instances like x1 here is an instance, think of it as an email, and the mind of nature at play on that instance, the label associated with that email. So for so this is a set of pairs. So this could look something like x1 and spam. X1 here is an email, X2 not spam. Or like the data that you saw for badges. So one person gets a plus, the other person gets a minus, it's a list of that. So what we have there is a finite list. Okay, I've written here, shown here N examples. I'll get to you in a minute. A finite list of uh, instances on which the target function has been applied. We don't have access to the target function itself, but we have access to this collection of examples. We throw all of this into a learning algorithm and the learning algorithm spits out another function, G. G has the same signature as the target function. G also maps an instance to a label. G maps X to Y. G takes an input instance and produces a label. Essentially, the learning algorithm looks at all these labeled examples and produces its best guess of what the target function might be. So, uh, sorry, I didn't ask your name, but you, what was your name? Andrew. Andrew. What Andrew did was to look at the badges data and uh, um, produce a, produced a function. So this box here was Andrew, because that was the learning algorithm or whatever algorithm you use. But there could be other algorithms. We can't use Andrew for you know everything. Um, but there are other uh, 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 learning algorithms, of course. And the job of the now seen from this perspective, the learning algorithm is really like a higher order function. Those of you who are familiar with these things, it's a program or a function that takes in some data and produces another program or another function. Question. Uh, it's just the training data. Okay. What do you mean by that? No, I just, uh, I'll call it D if you want, if it makes you happy. Um, no, I mean, I, I usually, uh, there is no consistent uh, naming for that. Usually the inputs are X and the labels are Y. And the data set is whatever is the free letter left behind. Okay, uh, this phase of the process is called the training phase. The training phase essentially uses, involves the labeled data being thrown into a learning algorithm and a learned function coming out of it. Now, the question for you is, 
based on what we saw in the first lecture, can you imagine other training protocols? Can you imagine other ways in which data might interact with a program to produce this sort of a, a target function? And we actually did discuss this briefly in the first lecture. Yes. Yeah. So one protocol. The answer was we can ask for, we can ask questions and get some data uh, proactively or actively. So that's active learning. This is supervised learning. In active learning, the learning algorithm has an arrow coming out of it into the data and saying, oh, you know what? There is an instance x n plus one that's not labeled yet. What do you think is the label for x n plus one? And so it accumulates data as it goes along. In reinforcement learning, the learning program interacts with the world. And uh, instead of actually getting access to the label directly, it gets a reward. And the goal of the learner is to maximize the reward. Um, and along the way, do good to the world and things like that. So this is not the only protocol for learning. There are other protocols. We'll be covering supervised learning quite extensively, but there are other uh, learning protocols, active learning being one of them. Any questions about anything that you've seen so far? Are there any questions on Zoom? I guess my TS are handling all of them. So we have now this uh, instance space uh, and the label space and the target function that we do not know, but we have access to the target function in the form of the training data or access to the target function in action in the form of the training data. And using that, we have produced this learned function that uh, I'm calling G. So we have um, this function F that we don't have access to and we have uh, G. Now the question, something for you to think about is, how do you know that G is good? Any ideas? How would you evaluate G? Yes. Yes, it's uh, to get labels for new data. You ask it to predict labels for new data. So there's going to be some other example, uh, let's say X n plus one, and you give it to G, and let's say it produces some label, and luckily you also happen to have you manage to somehow coax the target function into giving it the label for that particular example. And if these two are the same, then G gets a point. If those two are not the same, G doesn't get that point. So uh, essentially the more general way of doing the thinking about it is we sample random test examples from the instance space again. And give it both to F and G and see if they're different. Or if sometimes you might not be able to uh, know whether they are different uh, because, or you know, sometimes the, it's not just identity that matters, but also the degree of difference. Sometimes you could ask how different is it? And uh, both of those work. Um, you, in practice, of course, we may not be able to call upon the target function on a new example because the target function does not, we don't have access to it. So instead we have, we set aside a collection of examples that we will call test examples before anything. And then uh, we'll train the model. I'm calling using the, uh, the word model for G here. We'll train the model and apply it to the test examples and compare it to the target prediction. And you do it one time, maybe that the model got it, the answer right accidentally. Maybe it just tossed a coin. It's like a one of these lousy models that uh, uh, or lousy classifiers or learned programs that uh, tosses a coin every time it sees an input and predicts uh, the label plus if the coin says heads and minus otherwise. There's a 50% chance you'll get it right accidentally. So 
you uh, getting it uh, getting the label right on one example is not sufficient so you need to aggregate the result over a large collection of test examples question for you we seem to have these test examples that are not used for training can you use them to also make the model better yes what you just described is something called cross validation and you will be doing that in one of your homeworks actually most of your homeworks um, but not exactly that um, a, a slight slightly more controlled version of that but my question was what I described was there is, there is this training collection of examples. You trained your classifier on that. And then I said, oh, there's going to be this test examples that are set aside, and I'm going to evaluate the model on that. Why not just use those extra data to train the model? Yeah. Um, you would get a model that's really, really good at reading your examples, but might not be good at reading it from you. That's right. Test you need to test for generalization. Did you raise your hand? Yeah, we need to I don't know what the word overfitting means. Uh, we haven't encountered that word yet. Um, <laughs> but uh, basically, yeah, the, the idea is right. If you test, if you train your model on the test data, then what will happen is your model will get really good on the test data. It's not going to generalize. Remember, the goal of learning is not about doing well on that particular set of test examples. That particular set of test examples is just uh, an, a, a sort of a simulation of the future where the model is going to get used. You're just going to evaluate your model on those test examples to kind of tell your customer, if you're selling the model, hey, I had some held out data and this is how well it did on that held out data. So I expect it to do well on future examples also. If you train using the test data, then the model will just memorize the examples and uh, you can't say anything about performance uh, based on performance on those test examples. The analogy here is, um, let's say I ask you questions in your midterm or final that are identical to what you saw in your homework. You probably would get them right. I hope you get them right. But that doesn't tell me anything about your ability to generalize because I have to change something Otherwise, how would I know whether you are able to generalize beyond what you saw? So it is extremely important to make sure that your test set does not contaminate your training set. Um, I have seen research papers being rejected for that reason. I've seen state-of-the-art, so-called state-of-the-art machine learning being reduced to nothing because it turned out that the model was contaminated by the test data. The, you cannot you cannot draw any conclusions about the model once the data is contaminated. So make sure that whatever else you learn from this class, let this be one of the, uh, let this be in it. Do not ever make sure that your experimental protocol is clean. Make sure that your test set does not contaminate your training data. Okay, so let's kind of uh, abstract things out a bit. In the general setting for supervised learning, you are given a collection of training examples of the form x and f of x where x is uh, f is a target function that is unknown and x is the instance typically x is an uh, the or, or an input or an example typically this example is represented as uh, feature vectors feature vectors are just high dimensional uh, representations of the data uh, for example you could have the feed the an example as uh, this is notation that means this here this means a vec a big bit vector of zeros and ones of some sort of, of that kind this is just saying a collection of d real numbers d dimensional feature vectors and and uh, typically, this process of converting uh, your input, like you know, your email or your document or your collection of names, into at least some sort of a preliminary feature vector, is a deterministic process. Before uh, sending it on to more complicated uh, uh, processing, the goal is to get the label right for each example, 
And for that particular training example, x, f of x is, is called a slip. In fact, the goal of learning is not to get the label right for that example, but to use those training examples to find a good approximation of this hidden function f. Uh, the kind, the, the type of label that we have, the label space, tells us what kind of a learning problem we have. If the label space has only two things in it, a plus or a minus, or spam or not spam, true or false, we call it binary classification. If the label space has some finite number, k, of uh, discrete categories, we call it multi-class classification. If the label space is the set of all possible real numbers, we call it regression. There are other kinds of label spaces, and we will not see them in this class simply because those require more advanced stuff. But uh, the label space essentially decides what kind of a learning problem we have. Any questions about uh, instances, labels, and the target function? Yeah. Well, I mean, Absolutely no reason. Um, like no reason at all. Okay. Something different from like This is just real numbers. Same as that. Any questions that are not about notation? Not about my LaTeX skills. Yes. Um so kind of looking at this, it seems like the hard part is coming out with a key today. Um, not doing the what? Doing, so like the classification and their regression. Like, that seems like the easy part, but coming up with a good feature that seems like that is very difficult. I strongly agree. Uh, typically, people don't agree with that, especially people in this class. I mean, not this particular class, but in an intro to machine learning class, because we'll spend most of our try, time inventing learning or looking at different kinds of learning algorithms, and that will seem like a lot of work. But in fact, as we get to the end of the semester, we'll hopefully converge on this idea that learning algorithms are actually easy. Representing data is extremely hard. Now, uh, I think I mentioned this in the last lecture. I'll say it again. One of the big revolutions that's happened in the last uh, 10, 15 years is the recognition that for a large class of problems, the task of coming up with features can itself be converted into a learning problem. And we can keep doing that you know, iteratively, and that's how you get multi-layer neural networks. So multi-layer neural networks are essentially learning systems that produce features for other learning systems that produce features, and so on, till at some point you run out of patience and say, okay, let me use these features and get a label. Other thoughts, other questions? I'll spend a little bit more time discussing features. If there are no questions, let me move forward. Um, binary classification is by far one of the most common things that you will see, uh, definitely in this class, because it's easy um, uh, and it makes for nice, well-contained homeworks. Um, spam filtering, and it's also very uh, widely applicable. If you have a spam filter, uh, you can think of a, the job of a spam filter as taking an email and deciding whether it's spam or not spam for two categories. A recommendation system can be framed as a binary classification task. Given a user and a movie, the pair together in this case is the instance. Given a user and a movie, will the user like the movie plus or not minus? Uh, you can think of anomaly detectors as uh, binary classifiers. So if you have a uh, uh, an app store, if you are running an app store, um, you could uh, try to fr frame the task of detecting a malicious app as a binary classification task. Is the app malicious or is it not? In that case, the instance is the app itself. Similarly, uh, is uh, social media user a bot or not? Uh, again, two classes. Sometimes uh, you can look at two documents and uh, you might be wondering, are these two written by the same person? They have a yes or a no. And again, it's a binary classification task. Authorship identification, I put this here mostly to point out that uh, this was the basis of uh, uh, a competitive class project, I think in 2018 or something, where I gave the class 
a data set of something like a collection of pairs of documents and the task for the class was to decide whether they were written by the same person or not um, and just to kind of uh, uh, make it a little bit more uh, interesting i also told the class then and i'll tell you now that that particular thing was uh, sort of constructed and successfully solved by a high school student um, so i figured grad students and seniors should be able to do it um, the another uh, binary classification task is uh, you can frame certain kinds of time series prediction as binary classification. So will the stock price for some stock increase tomorrow or not? Again, two classes. I'm not saying that's the best way of doing it, but if you have that tool that does binary classification, that learns binary classifiers, you can adapt it into a lot of circumstances. Okay, um, example type in about the ha half an hour or 40 minutes that are left. I'm going to talk about uh, uh, the various uh, aspects of supervised learning that we should be able to uh, uh, we should be able to decide as we go as we encounter a new learning problem. In particular, I'll not talk about items four and five. I'll only talk about one, two, and three, and uh, spend the rest of the semester on four and five. The first question we should be able to answer is: What is the instance space? What how, what are the things that are inputs to our models? Um, usually the problem naturally presents the instant space to you. If I tell you that your job is to classify a smartphone app, naturally the instance is an app, right? But that's not the hard part. The hard part, as uh, we discussed a little while back, is designing the right representations for those instances. Instances are typically represented by features or attributes, and um, Coming up with the right features requires some sort of uh, brainstorming. Uh, the features could be Boolean. So a good indicator for a spam email is, uh, does the email contain the word free? Yes or no? So it's a, it's a single bit. So you have one feature there. Features could also be real value. So what's the height of a person? Or what's the weight of a car? Or what's the stock price yesterday? And these features could be handcrafted like the list I gave here, or they could be themselves learned as I mentioned a little while back. Now, personally, I like to think of things that construct features as functions of their own. So I am gonna call them feature functions or feature extractors. And these feature extractors um, essentially are functions that take input instances and convert them into high dimensional vectors. And this is an important part of the design of a learning solution. And, uh, uh, you know, the, the thing is, if, 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 if I want to write it this way, so I have an input example x, I convert it using a feature function that for some reason I'm going to use the Greek letter phi, converts it into phi of x. Now this phi of x is a real vector. And then this goes into your target classifier that you've learned, let's say, or the target function or the learned classifier or whatever, some function G, and it produces a Y. So the thing to note here is this, the, the model that you train knows nothing about the input X that is not inside phi of X. So feature functions or features are supposed to capture everything, all information that is relevant for this learning problem inside that high dimensional vector. And uh, another uh, good analogy for features is uh, you can think of it as uh, the sort of sensory inputs to a learned system. So anything that is not captured in those sensory inputs are not going to get uh, acted upon by the model. Of course, not everything that is in a feature function is relevant. You might not know what are good features for the task, so you might throw everything you can think about uh, into the feature vector and hope the learning algorithm kind of distills out the signal from the noise, which might seem like a good idea because you know I don't know what are good features, let the algorithm figure it out. Unfortunately, if you have bad features, things could get really, really bad. Uh, bad features might not just make learning hard, it could actually confuse the learner and we can kind of, uh, if, you, if you are interested offline, I can show you some toy examples 
where bad features completely practically erase the signal. So rather than thinking about features abstractly, can people, what are some good features for the badges game? What might be some good features for the badges game? Yes. So you'll represent the name. Let's use uh, uh, that's the name. Okay. So you'll represent. Can you tell me what the feature is for this? Oh, you're thinking of ASCII, aren't you? Let's use ABCD. That's your name. And your proposal is one, two, three, four. Okay, what if now you have another person whose name is E, F, and G? Five, six, seven, zero. Yes, good point. This is actually where I was taking it, the discussion. These feature vectors all have to be the same size. They have to be, remember, the feature, uh, at some point I mentioned that uh, the feature vectors are all d-dimensional vectors. D is fixed. Any other features? But uh, I'll come back to this point. This, this I'm going to argue, is not the best feature for this data, um, unless you do something very fancy. Other thoughts? Yeah. That's exactly this, right? Oh, I see, I see. So you'll have, okay, I see your point. So you have a vector of size 26. This is the, and dot, 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 that's A. And then B, that's B, and so on. And you'll just add them up as in like plus. Okay, that, that basically that tells the system what are the letters in the data. Any other, yeah. Actually, you've already spoken before. I haven't heard your voice today. Um, I, I first. Length of the first name. So this becomes four. If this was the last name, this becomes three. One more. Uh, Maybe from someone who's not answered so far. Can it be a vowel or consonant? So can uh, an indicator for whether it's a vowel or a consonant? There's one on Zoom. There's one on Zoom. Uh, number of vowels in the first name and number of vowels in the last name, which has a dimensionality of two. So in this case, this becomes number of vowels is one. And let's say this is first name. And this is last name. And here the number of vowels is in the last name is one. So there's an A and an E. Okay, so there are interesting features that you're inventing. Uh, let me see what I had in my list. Um, before we go into the list of features for the badges, I want to point out, and it's kind of uh, connected to the discussion that we had. Uh, it's important to note that we have a fixed dimensionality. So we have a fixed dimensional vector that we need to convert all inputs into. So you cannot convert one input into a list of three numbers and a second input into a list of 14 numbers because the next stage of the program does not know what to do with it. Every element, every dimension here is called a single feature and we have D features in all. So you have essentially D, a D dimensional uh, point. So at this point, uh, some of you have encountered the notion of d-dimensional vector spaces in the past, and some of you have not. And those of you who have not seen it before might find that idea a little bit disturbing. Um, but even those of you who have seen it before might find the idea disturbing um, because it's very hard. I say hard, I don't 
it's impossible to visualize these dimensions. Um, you can think of two dimensions. Here we have a feature space with a two-dimensional feature space. Every point in the two-dimensional feature space is, uh, this is the point x1, x2. D dimensions is just like this. <laughs> you know, it's a, imagine instead of it's two uh, bases, you have D bases. At this point, I would recommend try not visualizing it. Um, it will get you, give you a headache. Um, think uh, we have to resort to algebra, but essentially we have uh, uh, points in D dimensional vector spaces that are our feature spaces, and we can use ideas from geometry to kind of uh, reason about these points. There is a um, um, there's a bit of a joke about how do you visualize D dimensions, and one answer is. Uh, you don't. You visualize d minus one dimensions, and by induction, you add one more, or something of that sort. Um, anyway, um, so when you when you apply machine learning out in the wild, you'll spend a good part of your time thinking about features. Um, the 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 success of deep learning has kind of reduced the burden on feature design quite a bit, but it has not eliminated it fully. Uh, so often you might end up spending your uh, uh, people, former students of mine who've been interned uh, as data scientists have told me they were called data scientists, but really they should have been called feature engineers uh, because that's what they did for a bulk of their uh, work. So you can think of them as templates. So for instance, one feature could be the second letter of the last name. The That means this particular for the name Naoki, uh, it's the second letter is in A, but essentially following the proposal that we had before, we have a vector of with 26 entries, one for each letter. The first position corresponds to A, it has a one, everything else is a zero. A has a one in the second position and everything else is a zero and so on. Uh, what's the dimensionality of these vectors? How many numbers are in these? 26. So. We have 26 dimensional points here. See, very easy to build up high dimensions. Just for one feature, literally just one feature, I managed to get 26 dimensions here. Incidentally, these kinds of encodings are very common, where you have a vector with zeros everywhere except in one dimension. These encodings are called one hot uh, encodings or one hot vectors, and you will see them a lot, um, th that phrase a lot. Um, this, what we have here uh, is an uh, example of uh, one hot encodings for this feature template called the second letter of the name. Uh, you could also have another feature called length of the name. Naoki, this, in this case, in the, Naoki gets converted to pi and Abe gets converted to three. What's the dimensionality of this, this feature? Just one, it's a single, uh, real number. You could also just accumulate features. So here I have three features, the second letter of the name, length of the first name, and length of the last name. So this is, let's say, second letter of the first name. So I have this 26 dimensional one hot embedding plus these two numbers. So this becomes 28 dimensional features. Features can be accumulated by just concatenating them. Any thoughts or questions or comments about uh, this uh, way of thinking? Yes. Uh, if we uh, add like features together, is learning that inherently different or are they still like inside? We still have the same. Outcome. So, like when learning, like, would it make a difference if we added like three features or if we like, combined like added into one? What do you mean by add it into one feature? So for example, in the last one, the second level of the name, length the first name, and length the last name, if we had them as separate features, these like three different features, it can be different. If you have no, eventually you need to convert it into a single vector uh, because that is the interface that most learning algorithms are going to use. Uh, most of them, not all. Um, but one way or another, it's going to be a one single collection of things. Yes. Other questions, other comments? 
Yeah. Yeah, you can. Yeah, you can add as many dimensions as you want. This is where this is why feature engineering comes in. But here's the point: you can add whatever features you want. I can add a feature that says is today a Tuesday or not. I can add a feature uh, that says uh, is this January or not, uh, or whatever. Right? You can you can keep brainstorming features, but you have to be careful. If you add bad features, you might make learning harder. If you add noise, noisy features, even if the right answer is somewhere in that, the fact that most of the feature vector is wrong is going to essentially overwhelm the learning algorithm. So we have to be careful. We don't want to just throw everything we can think of into the system. At the same time, we can't take the risk and not throw everything. So this is a bit of a trick, tricky thing. Okay. Um, good features, as I said, is essential. Um, and there are, it's easy to come up with bad features. And uh, a lot of effort goes into feature design. Uh, in this class, we won't be talking about feature design per se. Why? Because it depends on the particular problem you'll be working on. If you're going to be working on a problem involving names, you'll have to design features involving names. If you're going to work on a problem involving the stock market, you may have to invent features involving the stock market. The coolest feature involving the stock market that I've seen uh, that I heard of was around 2000 or 2001. Um, uh, a hedge fund that was built, use, built using a machine that was using machine learning to uh, make decisions would import weather data from, I think, certain regions in Africa and use weather for certain times of the year for certain regions in Africa as features to decide whether or not they should purchase coffee stock in, or Starbucks. Um, uh, because it impacts the production of coffee and that impacts the prices and all that impacts the profit and that thing. Think about like the amount of detail you need to think in, you know, going to, to invent that feature. Apparently that gave, I, I remember speaking to that uh, person while back, that gave them an edge for a few months until other hedge funds caught on and that feature became useless. But, you know, uh, you have to think about these things. All right, so that's all I have to say about instance space. I was going to, I was hoping that I would be done about 10 minutes back, but uh, uh, it was a good uh, digression. Uh, let's talk about the label space. The label space is um, uh, the thing that we are going to predict, the, the set of all possible labels that our learned system can uh, output. And so, so far, the examples that I had were all about binary classification. And we'll see a lot of this. If uh, binary classification is uh, uh, really one of the bread and butter of a uh, lot of machine learning, partly because, as I said, it's a bit easy. Um, I'm hoping that we'll have time for at least one lecture on multi-class classification. Uh, sometimes maybe the output is not um, um, a, just a single label, but a structure like a table or a graph or a um, uh, you know a program in that case uh, the the task is called structured classification or structured prediction where the output is a graph valued output uh, the example that i gave in the first lecture where you have a sequence of uh, proteins amino acids and the program has to predict the 3d structure of a protein was an example of structured classification in all of these the common commonality across these three things is uh, that the output is categorical. The output is discrete. Uh, and together, typically when the output is discrete, we call those problems classification problems. Sometimes the output could be numbers, numerical, in which case uh, the, the kind of a learning problem is called regression, where the output is maybe the set of all possible real numbers or maybe a subset of all real numbers, maybe uh, the output is a probability, so a number between 0 and 1. All of these are examples of regression. Sometimes the output could be ordinal, um, where we, we don't care about actually predicting a score or a number, but we only care about ranking things. So there is a relative order between, um, between the labels. So for example, if you are building a classifier that predicts these reviews or the, the, the star ratings, you have five star ratings, one, two, three, four, five. 
You can think of this as uh, you know classification task. You know there are five labels to predict, but in fact there these five labels are not equally distant from each other. The label with five star is closer to the label with five four star than it is to one. So there's a implicit sort of ordering between them. In this case, uh, you call these. Uh, uh, this also becomes this is a different kind of a learning problem. In this class, we'll touch upon regression at least in one lecture. We'll touch upon binary classification a lot, and we'll, uh, if time permits, cover multi-class classification. Yes. Um, this gets a little bit more Yeah, that's often how it's done. Yeah. We one of the reasons why we cover binary classification and regression in these classes is the basic tools that we will encounter are essentially like the building blocks for the more complicated kinds of uh, learning problems. So if you uh, uh, if you have a good grasp of the tools that are needed for binary classification and regression, you'll be able to essentially glue them up and compose them into programs that can do these other things. I just noticed there was a question on Zoom. Some of the feature selection seems like hashing. So some of the discussion on feature selection seems like hashing. That's a good point. Feature selection may seem like hashing. It may seem like we take some inputs and we need to convert it into some hash value. Except it's not. Because um, when we think about hashing, we don't really care about the semantics of those hash hashes. And the second thing, perhaps the more important thing, is nearby instances, we hope through our transformation process, get mapped into nearby points in this d-dimensional space. There is no such requirement with hashing. In fact, with hashing, we hope nearby example, uh, a small change to an email should produce wildly different hashes. Uh, to the input should produce wildly different hashes, but with feature extraction, we want some sort of similarity to be maintained. That's the uh, technical difference, really. All right. Um, we have 15 minutes for today, and I want to spend the rest of the time that we have on this point number three, uh, which is uh, called the hypothesis space. I remember, I said learning is all about searching over a space of functions. Anytime you have a search problem, you need to think about what is the set that you're searching over. Now, the set of functions that your learning algorithm explores is called the hypothesis space. Learning, if learning is search over functions, then we need to define formally the search space that uh, the learning algorithm has to explore. But before we actually get into details about the hypothesis space, let's uh, look at an example. Suppose I present to you um, a hidden function, f that takes two inputs that are Boolean, either zero or one, and produces one output, which is also zero and one. And I tell you that uh, this is the set of, uh, this is your training data. Can you guess what this function is? Uh, and I want the answer from someone who's not spoken so far. Yes. Uh, it's the AND function. Yes, that's right. So, um, this unknown function is clearly one if and only if both x1 and x2 are one. So this is a Boolean, this is the logical conjunction or the logical and. Okay, that was easy. But let me now uh, tell you something that is kind of a little disturbing. Machine learning is fundamentally ill-posed. Instead of uh, those two inputs, let's say that I have four inputs and I give you this table of examples. Can you tell me what this function is?
Yeah. X4 and not X2. X4 and what? Not X2. And not X2. I. Is that right? Can someone else tell me? There, yeah, no way. Uh, maybe uh, I'm not going to check each row. Um, is that the only function? There are many, many functions, right? In fact, how many functions are there that satisfy this interface? And two, two. two. Power four. Two power four. The one answer is two power four. Any other thoughts? Can you justify your? Uh, maybe I was just talking about the invisible thing, but if you could combine the four variables, it would be uh, two power sixteen, I guess, because you could also combine each of those four variables. Uh, your answer is right. I didn't understand your explanation. I think you are thinking about the right answer, the right explanation, though. Um, like, like, you can have, uh, you can make an four clauses, each clause. Oh, I see. Bars and then okay, you're kind of building the Boolean expression. Yeah. Okay, that's, uh, there's an easier way to get to the answer. I'll tell you in a minute. Um, <coughs> there are two power 16, that's right, bo possible Boolean functions. Why? Let me write down the full truth table. Here I have four bits, y, x1 through x4. Each bit can take two values. So x1 can either be a zero or a one. So you, x2 can be a zero or a one and so on. So there are 16 possible rows in this truth table. So there are, what is a Boolean function? A Boolean function is just a way of putting a zero or a one in each place. Every way in which you put a zero or a one gives you a different function. So if I choose to put all zeros here, that's a function. The function that takes any input and produces a zero. If I choose to produce, put a one here and a zero everywhere else, that's a different function. That's a function that takes any the, the four inputs and produces one if all of them are false, right? And I can do this any number of times. So another way of thinking about it is there are 16 possible slots. Each slot can be occupied by a zero or a one. So each slot can be filled with one of two things. So you have two things for the first position, two things for the second position, two things for the 16th position. There are 16 such slots. So you have two power 16. That's the, so you have two power 16 possible Boolean functions, which is 65,536 possible functions of four inputs. And we have only seen our training data only shows us seven of those uh, uh, entries. There are all these question marks that are not filled up. We can fill them up in any way, right? Let's say you tell me a function. Uh, the function that uh, we heard from before was x2 and not x4. If this function was proposed, then me being, let's say I, I'm being adversarial here. I want to make sure that the proposed answer is wrong. I will choose a row where that one of these question marks, let's take this row here, x2 and not x4 gives you a zero, right? A false, because x4 is true, so this function is false. What I'll do is just to prove the answer wrong, I'll say, you know what, the hidden function that I had actually was a one here. Every time you come up with a function, I will choose a row that makes that function wrong. I'll just flip the bit. Does that make sense? This is a uh, this is a sort of a this is an adversarial argument. If you believe that the holder of the target function is adversarial and is is deliberately trying to prove whatever you come up with uh, is wrong, then every time you come up with a function, what I'll do is I'll apply that function to one of those question marks, find the label that that function gives, and tell you that. Oh, you know what? You made a mistake because that particular row was the opposite label. In which case, the only way in which you can actually learn the function is if I, I reveal every possible row in this truth table. 
how could we possibly learn if this was the case? How could learning ever exist? At this point, one of two things, either you are all shocked into silence because I'm claiming that, uh, because you're wondering how I'm going to spend the rest of the semester if I tell you that learning is not possible, <laughs> or you didn't get what I'm saying. Yes. The what? Ah, so you, here we have four features, right? In practice, I'm not kidding. I have worked on problems where the dimensionality is not four, but a few million. Uh, once you get into million dimensional vectors, here we had two power 16 functions, right? So that is two power, two power four. The set of possible functions with million dimensional features is two power, two power a million. It's a mind bogglingly large number. How could we, uh, how could we hope that anything is small? At this point, you have to ask me questions because the, I'm not going to go ahead until this point comes through. Yes. Well, what if you can make something based on two variables and another trace of two variables and combine those? Like, what's the not all That's a, which two way? Okay, the, the, uh, the proposal here is what if we could make some assumptions about some set of these variables, state that they are not independent of each other, kind of essentially merge them, and rather than this large number of two power, 10 power, six, we bring it down to us, we essentially do dimensionality reduction and kind of control the feature space. How much would you reduce it to? Is 100 million functions small enough? How about a trillion? Yes. Uh, it's possible that we can do double blind experiments, so nobody knows what it, you know, what the, the result, the testing result would be, and then both of them can compare the results after the review of the top of the new system. Um, to do compare the, sorry, what is the purpose of this experiment? So, problems like the same data, I, I think that I learned the function, but the testing part of it, you know, you know, what the answer I gave. And then... But how would the, the, yes, that's, okay, that's the right way to do things, really. But how would you even learn the function if you have to enumerate this number of functions to find the right one? Yes. How much data do you want? Um, let's say that this is a problem that for which you have data and getting more data is not possible. Or let's say getting data is expensive. Let's say that uh, getting more data requires you to hire a radiologist. Uh, and every hour of their time is so expensive that you can only get a certain number of data points. I think so, um, you had a point, something to say? I was, I was just going to say, I, I think that you know, that. I like that. Yeah, that's a perfectly reasonable answer. Why should I care to find the right function? If I get a function that's good enough, I'll be happy. That's a reasonable strategy that we'll actually operationalize at, uh, somewhere later uh, in the semester. But, uh, you know, the answer really is, and many of you touched upon ideas of the answer. Yes. Could we possibly learn some approximation of that? Yeah, that's uh, essentially the same thing. How do we, can we learn an approximation of the true function? Can we live with good enough? Right. That's one way of getting at it. Another way of thinking about it is to kind of make it more, uh, sort of make this process a little bit more rigorous. We can uh, adopt the school of thought that says, when in doubt, make an assumption. Um, instead of, remember, the, the, when I said the hypothesis space is the search space for the learning algorithm, when did I say that the search space should include every possible function? 
if it is if the hypothesis space for every possible function then learning is impossible because there are so many functions well let's not do that let's not search through every possible function let's make an assumption let's make an assumption that uh, uh, is that restricts the class of functions that our learner will explore we will make an assumption that says essentially that of the form i believe nature or uh, the teacher or whoever is inventing this function is not adversarial nature is not nature is not free enough to choose a function arbitrarily from the set of all possible boolean functions it can only choose a function from a well defined subset of them one example could be um, in in this particular case maybe just simple conjunction where we take some subset of these variables and put an and in between them and we only look through those functions that's a smaller set or there's something called m of n rules where we pick a set of n of these variables and if at least m of them are true then uh, the function is true or we can have linear functions or we can have multi layer neural networks we can have convolutional neural networks transformers and whatever every one of these is an assumption about the hypothesis space every one of these is an assumption that says i believe that nature is not adversarial and instead operates according to the according to the rules that i am going to define nature is only going to pick a function that sits inside this family of functions that i am allowed to search that search space is called the hypothesis space the set of functions that your learner explores in the 3 minutes that are left i'm going to show you this one example this table that we had um consisted of seven rows it turns out if i if if i restrict my hypothesis space to simple conjunctions then there are only 16 possible conjunctions of this type a simple conjunction really is you pick some subset of these variables maybe x2 x4 the output is true if both of them are true this uh, this is the simple, this is the boolean and the output is true if uh, x2 is true and x4 is true this is a simple conjunction i am not allowed to use negation i am not allowed to use an or i will leave it as an exercise for you to uh, convince yourself that there are only 16 uh, simple conjunctions um one uh, the, or in general if you have n variables there are only 2 power n simple conjunctions for four conjun for four inputs it's easy to enumerate all of them one conjunction is just i pick the variable x1 and say the output is true when x1 is true here i have i pick x1 x2 and x3 and the output is true when all three of them are true always false is i pick none of them the output is true when none of them are true they, these are the 16 ones and uh, it turns out sadly for these 16 things for every one of them i can find a counter example so if i take x1 x2 x3 uh let me find the row here that row there x1 and x2 and x3 for that particular row should be false but the data says it's true for every row every possible 16 of these 16 simple conjunctions at least one of these rows is a counter example so turns out no simple conjunction explains the thing our hypothesis space we made an assumption we believe that nature picks a simple conjunction it turns out nature is not so kind i'll stop after telling you the answer uh, since i have a minute i'll tell you the answer to the or i'll say i'll give you a hint for the answer turns out that uh, if we pick a different hypothesis space called m of n rules and i'll leave it as an exercise for you to see whether this works where i pick some subset of these variables i pre choose some of these variables i just define x3 x my inter variables of interest are x1 x3 and x4 and that is n and if at least m if two of them are one the output is one otherwise the output is zero so an exercise for you and you can tell me the answer at the beginning of the next lecture um if there is one of the if an m of n rule uh perfectly satisfies this data and also think about how many m of n rules are there all right i'll stop now and uh, i will see you all hopefully next tuesday thanks Thank you.